Okay. Um, you guys, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Great. So this is what we saw last time about uh, cash and how we can either have a, use a modulo function to produce these 40 and the five, you know, there's to know exactly where to put. Block 40 can only go here, as opposed to this diagram where we uh, could put any block anywhere. And the main difference is that here we will jump directly to the line that we, to the block that we need and see if it's there or not. And here we have to do a parallel search. Um, now he talks about this, we talk about for any method that we're gonna use, we're gonna have to uh, answer four questions, which is where in the cache will the memory be mapped to? That's what we just discussed. Where we'll actually put the memory block? Anywhere or in a particular location? We also could talk about, uh, we also have to answer the question, how do we locate in the cache the block containing the byte we are? In other words, <clears throat> we have to, how are we gonna find it once we wanna find it? Once we've mapped it, once we put it there, how do we find it? Well, it's kind of the reverse process of mapping. But um, obviously we're gonna have to explain how we're going to find it. When the data byte is not in cache, we have to answer this question. Will we need to load the, rel we will need to load the relevant block? If the cache is full, for example, we'll need a methodology for choosing which block to remove. In other words, if, if there's every space is full, we're gonna to have to choose. If it's direct mapping, like we explained over here, where every has an exact location, then there's not much thought gonna go into it. what we remove. We're gonna only remove the one that we, that we must remove. In other words, we can only put 40 in this location. So, he'll be the, so whatever was there before will be removed. Now, um, but if it's the other method, we could put it anywhere, we have to decide who we're gonna remove. And we talked, about, I don't know if we talked about this, but we can decide to remove the one that we least recently used. That would be one method. Another method might be remove the one that's furthest away from the one that we, current, that we, rec that we last used. In other words, we last used two, and now we wanna load in uh, three, so we're gonna get rid of 17, because he's the farthest away, even though we might have just recently used 17. We'll choose the location because because we know something about code, which is that it if if we're loading if we're talking about loading in the code of your program the program code, then it's usually that you do line after line you do in the same area of the code. Sometimes you have a function jump, and you might do some other area of the code, but a lot of times uh, you do one line after the other. So you want to have the if you're gonna if you're gonna load in three, you don't want to get rid of two because you might be have a loop and go back to two. Remember, these blocks in general are very small. They're only 128 bytes. So for your program, you're gonna have several blocks. So you would, might wanna get rid of the one that is the furthest away, as opposed to the la last, least, as opposed to the least recently used. Two different methods. And we also have to ask when the, when the processor writes to cache, will the, I don't know if I talked, did I talk about this? Anyone remember, did I talk about the dirty bit? Yeah, you did. I did, okay. So we talked about right through and right back, whether I just mark off. Okay, so let's go on. Um, we talked about modulo. I can use mod as the way of finding it. And we did, for example, if I have a memory location 12 and I have eight blocks of space, let's say I have my, my cache is eight blocks of space. So, and I wanna go to block number 12, not memory 12, block 12. So I gotta do 12 modulo eight and I'm gonna get four and it's gonna take me to block four. And also, well, another example, if I wanted to go to block number 20, again, I would do eight, tw uh, 20 modulo eight and I would again get four actually. So that means I would actually go to the same place and now I have to check, is it there, is the one I want there or not? Now I wanted to show you something. Did I show you this? Yeah. Did I show you this before? Yeah. So this is a new slide I added uh, yesterday. So, or two days ago. I guess yesterday, because you didn't see it. Um, if modulo actually works very nicely, these eight is gonna work very nicely, or four, as long as it's a power of two. Modulo seven is we're never gonna use, because it's gonna be like a problematic number. Although we could, theoretically. But, but let's use a power of two. So it'd be two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. Those are the possible you know, numbers that we'll use. And then we can note an interesting thing. Well, 12 modulo four is zero, that's true. 
and 13, and now let's look at that in binary. In binary, 12 is 1100. Zero, zero. Now if I look at the last two bits, I will get a zero, and that's exactly what I wanted. Why the last two bits? Because four is two modulo two. It's two, sorry, two to the power two. So if it's two to the power two, there's a two over here, I'm gonna look at two bits, and it's gonna tell me what the modulo is. The zero, zero means in other words, that, oh, those are the bits that tell me the modulo. Let's prove that. Let's do another example. What if it was 13 modulo two? Sorry, 13 modulo four, two to the power two. So 13 modulo four is obviously one. What about if I write 13 in binary? I'm gonna write it like this. And notice this is four and eight is 12, 13. Notice that the last two bits will tell me again the modulo. So this is a very nice feature that I don't have to do any actual division. I can just get, because division is a costly operation. I can just get the modulo as long as it's a power of two by looking at the last bits of the, of the number I'm interested in. So basically the reason it's two numbers is because it's four, meaning it's anything less than the fourth digit, like the, like the number four in binary, which would be one zero zero. Exactly, meaning anything that modulo four of it is zero will always end in zero zero. Meaning if it was, it, if, it, if, 40. We were doing if you want to represent eight, the number 40, in binary, no matter what, it, no matter what it is, I don't know, but I know the last two bits is zero zero. So, like, if it was modulo eight, then we'd be looking at the last three numbers. That's right. That's right. If it would be two to the power of three, then I'd look at the last three numbers. Well, that's exactly what I do in the next example. So let's that's, do an example of that. modulo two to the third, which is eight. So twenty six is another example. I'm just trying to show it to you, so you see that I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just trying to make you feel comfortable with the idea. 26 divided by eight is something, is three, Mo with remainder two. How do I write 26 in binary? I write it like this, 16 and eight is 24 plus two, 28, 26. Again, 16 and eight is 24 plus two is 26. And if I'm gonna do it's two to the power of three, there's a three over here. So I'm gonna look at three bits and I get zero, one, zero, and zero, one, zero happens to be two, so that's very convenient. However, as long as the, as long, I'll just look at the last bits. Now, we can do similar things. We're gonna start chopping up the address, basically what we're gonna do. And we're gonna say, instead of, let's say I wanna go to some address. I wanna go to some address. Did I talk about this last time? I don't, I don't think so. You no. didn't get to this slide? Okay. So example of the address structure. Given an address is 32 bits long, um, wait a second. Given that an address is 32 bits long, i.e. 2 to the 32nd power, that's the address. So that's how much, uh, 2 to the 32nd power is how much memory I have, which we say is 4 billion. We will, result, we will divide the address into three parts. The, we'll call them the tag, the set, and the line offset. And we'll, I'll explain each one. Here's a diagram of an example of how the address might be divided. In other words, we can divide this address in any way we want. There's no limitations. But this is the address. In other words, from the CPU's perspective, he just says, I want address number you know, 64. So 64 is gonna be a whole lot of zeros, and then whatever 64 is, well, 60, you know, in, in binary over here. Well, how much exactly is it gonna be? In this example, I have four for the line offset, but let's change it. Let's, let, me, let me do some annotation here. I'm gonna put a line here to indicate that there's two bits here, and I'll write a, a two here. And then this is gonna be three. Oh, this is a three. And this is, a, let's say, is a four. So I got two bits over here. I'm just changing it to just make it more simple. Um, I got two bits for this, two bits for this, and this, and this thing tag. Now, if he wrote an address, let's say, um, let's say 65. So what's 65 in hex? I mean, not in hex, in binary. Well, it's got, you're gonna have to have a, a 64 
Somebody help me out. What is a, uh, it's gonna have, I can write it over here. It's a 64 and then it's no 32, no, 20, no 16, no eight, no four, no two, but a one, right? So the seven? Is that right? One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. That would be 64, this is 65. I wanna address number 65. So that's, that means the CPU comes along and says, I'd like to go to address place 65. Now, that's totally great. He gives me the address. This whole thing is that 65, which means it's a whole lot of zeros. And then it's gonna be zero one over here. Because remember, this is just, we're, we're, we're putting imaginary lines on the address. And I'll see where, you'll see where this is going. Right now, you don't understand why I'm doing this. Uh, this whole thing is the address we want? This is the address. The CPU just wrote 65 and he wrote it and he says, please give me, please load the word, it's at location 65. So he wrote in the address 65. He wrote one here, a zero here, he wrote a zero, zero. That's this zero, this zero. And then he wrote a 100 over here. And then the rest is all zeros. Okay? He wrote all zeros. Now, in my example, since the set is only two digits, the set is what's um, going to determine the block modulo. In other words, in other words, my block, this is the length, the size, let me start again. This is the size of the block, the line offset, which means if I'm on a particular block, it's either line zero, zero, line zero, one, line one, zero, or line one, one, four possibilities. That means my block is of size four bytes. That is my block. That's a block. block. You know that because it's two digits in the line offset? Because it's two digits in the line offset, because I decided to put this imaginary line here, this is telling me the size of my block. Because the line offset, you can think about it as like you have an array. And when you have an array, what do you have? You say, which element in the array do I want? I want the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. Well, if that's called the offset. So this is called the offset. Now, there's the offset in the block. Once, I'm in, once I've determined which block I want, this is the offset. So that means as it is four possibilities only, it must be the block has four lines in it. So the block is, by definition, of size four. Now, the and block that, number... That would be four, what, four bytes? Exactly. So in other words, if I draw the memory, remember, if, remember, 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 you have to have this picture in your head. Oh, wait a second. You have to have, you have to have this picture in your head. This picture in your head. In other words, here's my memory. I've got block zero, block one, block two, block three, etc. To block n. What's the size of this block? We just are saying that the block in my example is not 128 bytes, but four bytes. Because I gave it two digits. So very small blocks. But if it would have uh, 128 bytes, that would mean, what, like, what would the offset be then? The offset would be, I think, two to the seventh, or something like that, two to the fifth. No, uh, I don't know, something like that. It would be whatever 128 is. How many? In other words, one less than 128. Two to the, I don't know, you know, you have to calculate it. Do you want me to tell you? You can, you can yeah, 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 I see what you mean. It'll be like, how many bits it'll be? If it's 120, that's why I picked a simple one because I don't want to have to think about it. 128 would be, you know, a 64, a six, and it's 127 would be the largest value. So that'd be a 64, 
a 32, a 16, an 8, a 4, a 2, and a 1. That's 7, yeah. 2 to the 7. So it'll be 7 bits. 128 is 7 bits. But I picked a, pick, a much easier example because I don't, I just want to show you the idea. Um, so the block is very small. And all the rest is what he writes here, the block number. In other words, which block is it? If it's all zeros, then it's the first block. Well, that makes sense if you think about it. Because if I wanted, for example, address in location one, memory address one, there's only one place like that in the whole computer, which block is it going to be? I ask you as a real question. Which block is memory address one going to be in? Basically in any system in the world. Zero. Thank you. Zero. It's going to be the first block. I mean, where else would it be? I mean, let's see, unless your blocks were less than two bytes long, which would be impossible. Um, you could have blocks of one byte long. That would be kind of crazy. But um, it'll, be, it'll be in the first block. Everyone sees that. Everyone understands that answer? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So if I, the question is, if I want block, if I want byte 64, Sorry, 65. I wrote 65 here. I mean, I'm jumping now. I gave you the most easy example. I can give you a medium example. Let's say a medium example. Where would byte 8 be? In which block? Remember, let's say we're starting at 0. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. So where would 8 be? In which block? Third. The third. It would be the first byte in the third block. Now, how would we write eight in memory? Well, we would write all zeros and then eight, which means, um, how do you write eight? Well, one and three zeros, but, but in this case, this is not in this case, right? Because you wouldn't have enough bits for it. Let's wait. No, no, no. I would wait a second. Um, byte eight. Let's start with a simple example. Wait a second. Let me go. Let me go here. Byte eight would be one. That would be a zero. So let's change that to a zero. Zero. No two. No four. But an eight. So it would be the third. So what did you say when I said to you, where would eight be in which block? would it be? I think you answered the third block. What's the number of the third block? It's not three. What's the number of the third block? The first block is zero. Yeah. The second block is one. So the third block is two. So if I write eight, one, zero, if I write, sorry, if I write it one, if I write all zeros over here, by the way, this will be a zero all zeros over here, and I want, I just, I don't know anything about your blocks and anything. I'm just a CPU, and I just say, please give me, you know, I just, I'm just a programmer. I just wrote a load word, give me block, give me byte number eight. And I just wrote byte number eight. So I wrote one, zero, zero, zero. Now the CPU is going to look at it and say, I'm curious, which block is that in? Well, guess what? In order to find out that it's in the block, the third block, which is block number two, I just ignore this section and I look at this section. I look at the whole thing. All these zeros and then a one and then a zero. Well, what is that value? That's, that's two. That's two. Two is exactly the block number that I want. That's why it's written here, block number. This part of the address will represent the block number. Logically, by math, it's not like a convention. It just has to be that way. If this is the line number, then this will be the block number, all of this. Let's do another example. Let's say it's 65. So 65, we said, was, was, uh, just a second, draw, draw. 65, we said, was this, this, and this, right? That's 65. So now, without doing any extra work, I can just look at this and say, oh, 65 must be in block number, well, what, one, two, 
for a 16. It's in block 16. It's in block 16. And once I get, once I finally get the block 16, it's for sure at offset one. In other words, it's not zero. It's not the first byte in the block. It's the second byte in the block. So you understand, everybody understand why this is the block number. And as long as this is the offset number, then I've defined the size of the block. And then the rest of it must tell me which block it is. So why is the tag and the set index uh, separated? Isn't I really didn't the get same there thing? yet. Don't ask me what I didn't explain yet. I just want you to understand why it says the word block number here. And why it says the word line offset. Is that clear? Yeah, so this computer would have a lot of blocks. Like I have a big cache. Oh yeah, you're right. The no, it wouldn't the no the cache we don't know. Ah, you asked me. You are you are you are my straight man. You asked me exactly the right question because you said, well, how many blocks do we have in cache? I don't I don't know yet. I don't know yet. We didn't discuss that yet. We're about to discuss that. This is independent of that question. Because this is just telling me how many blocks are in memory, not in cache. Because this is all the memory space. And if, and this is, if I've divided this imaginary division, in other words, if I've made a logical division here, not a physical division, and I've said that each block is four lines long, then if I have four gigabytes of memory, I'm going to have you know, a heck of a lot of blocks. I'm going to view my four gigabytes of memory as though it were a lot, a lot of blocks, because each block is very small. All of these are the blo potential block numbers. But that doesn't mean that all of the blocks are going to be in cache. My cache could be very small. My cache could be just one. I could have just one block in cache ever. It's possible. It would be a very annoying computer to use, but I could. I could have two. I could have four. I could have eight. I could have 16. I could have a lot more, but I don't have to have enough cache to put all of memory in cache. In fact, I never would have that. This is a description of the memory. Now the question is, how many blocks are in cache? So that is determined by where I put this line here. That is determined by this line here, which means it's determined by what is the set and what is the tag. But let's talk about the set. The set will be how big the cache is. So in other words, because this, this, so in other words, if I've got two here, the cache must be two blocks long. Why? Well, because remember what we said about the modulo over here? Let's, let me just stop that. Remember what we said about the modulo over here? We said, no, oh, was it, where was the modulo? Here. We said that if it's two bits that I look at, then that's like doing modulo four. And if I'm doing, when, when am I doing modulo four? When I've got a cache, it's like this, four lines. I want to know, does the reticular block, does, blo does block number five, where does he go? Well, I've only got four, so I'm going to do modulo four. Modulo four on five gives me one, and that means block five is going to go right there. How did I do that? I did modulo four on it. In other words, I looked at two bits. Which two bits? Two bits of the block number. I took the five and I looked at its last two bit, two, bit, two bits. That's what I proved to you over here. I look at the last two bits of the block number. Well, what is the block number? This is the block number from, zero, from here until this line. So if I look at the Whatever number of bits I look at to decide where to put it in the cache, well, that number of bits will be the, will determine the size of the of what the cache must be. If it's two, then it's obviously I'm doing modulo four, which means there's four places in the box. If I had one more, it'd be modulo eight. And I'd have eight things in the, in the cache. If it would be one more, it'd be modulo 16. And I'd have four. I'd have 16 lines, four bits, I have 16 lines in my cache. So in this case, I did two. Two, each block is four lines long. 
And how many cache places do I have? Four. Potentially, I can put any block in one of those four, well, in its correct location, in direct mapping, in, its, in that place. What's the rest of this place? Well, first of all, do you understand the set? You understand how the set works? Questions on the set? So that tells us also which block to put it into? The set is going to tell us which cache block to put the memory block into. Like in this case, it's going to put it in, z in the, the first block. Zero in this block. Case, if it's 65, yes, it's going to put it in the first block. Let's see if that's right. What's 65? Ah, again, we're not going to look at the address. We're going to ignore the line offset. Remember, in my examples before, it was always the block number. I did the block number five, block number five, modulo four. So I, if I take the example here and it was 65, my block number is what? One, two, four, eight, 16. What's 16 modulo four? Zero. Yeah. The first place. That's what this told me. That's the set. So what's the rest of it? What's the tag? I mean, by the way, this is normally explained in like four minutes. I'm giving you a detailed explanation. I'm slowly explaining exactly why it works this way. By the way, this is going to be useful to you in the course in uh, operating systems. They talk about it again in operating systems. So try to remember this. Now the tag, what's the tag? Tag is whatever's left. Well, what is that whatever's left? That's whatever left. Turn this from being, let's say, block number, you know, block number zero also goes in cache location zero. Block number four also goes in cache location zero. Block number eight also goes in block number zero. All of those go in block number zero. What is this part of it? This tells me which exact block it is. Is it block zero? Is it the zeroth block? Is it the one after that? So we call it the tag. And it's like the English word attached, tag. They use that word, really it's like ID. You could think of it as the ID. But it's unique to the specific block. In other words, only one block that's in location zero can have that tag. Of course, a block in location one could also have that tag. But in location zero, only one block can have the tag one zero zero. Because any other block, if, if, if it had a different tag, in other words, um, right, only one can have it. If there was a different number here, then it would be a different block. It would be not 65, it would be 65 plus another 64, it would be 129. There was a one here. Memory, exactly. only memory location 65 has this tag when it sits in this set. Does the tag get saved when it gets copied to the block? Wait a second. First of all, this is all, nothing is being saved. So far, all we just talked about is, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question is yes, it's going to be up to save. But so far, this is how we're going to divide it, our virtual div divisions of the memory. Um, there, let me erase all this. If you got it all, I hope you have it all understood. Again, when you're doing this on a test, start from the line offset. Always start from the right. Nobody told me that. Nobody will tell you that except for me, that that's the right way to do it. In other words, that's what you know for sure, the line offset. And that tells you, that you can know either because he tells you how many bits it is or because or because he tells you the size of the block. If he tells you the block is of 16 lines, then you know the line offset is four. I think four, is that right? Five. 16 lines would be 15, which would be four, yes. Okay, so here we're gonna look at the exact structure of the cache, cache. That is the cache. So explanation, the size of the set field determines how many blocks are in the cache. Well, that's what we just said. 
So we're not going to write the set field, but that's just it. If I have block from zero to 511, that means I have 512, that means I have 512 blocks, which means that how many bits do I have? Uh, nine, right? Nine bits for the line offset. Either a zero, or they're all zero, and that's this one. If they're all one, then it's 511. Um, that's how many bits of the address of the 32 are, are going to be used for determining which location to go to in the cache row, which row to go to. Now I'm also going to have a valid bit, remember, because it could be I have to, to know whether, whether what's there is garbage or I've actually put a real memory in there. So valid will be the zero one. And then I also have to have the tag. The tag is that part of the address that I, that I explained to you. Now remember, I don't, the line offset, I'm not going to store in, in here. I'm just going to store the tag. The tag is the unique identifier. In other words, only one thing in this row in the cache can have that tag. That tag could be in a different row. I could theoretically have the same tag in every single row. And the only thing that would be different would be the, the row number. So again, the size of the set field determines how many blocks are in the cache. In our example, oh, so we're talking about our example where we have a, a, notice, wait a second, well, I said nine, right? Let's see if I'm right. I said this is nine from zero to 250. Let's see if I'm right. This should be, this is determined, the number of blocks is determined, we said, by the set. So five to 13, let's count it. Five. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's nine. Nine bits here determined that this must have 512 blocks. There are nine bits in the set field, so there are 256, two to the ninth blocks in cache. That's wrong. There are nine bits in the field, so there are that's wrong, right? Agreed? And appropriate is spelled wrong. Nobody corrected me. How do you spell appropriate? Um, no, that's also wrong. I don't have the, that's the appropriate spelling of appropriate. Okay, I thought I spelled it right. Also access is wrong. But also more importantly, is over here. This is wrong. What should this be? 512. 512. I don't know why I wrote that. But back to the previous picture, I'm, I'm trying to put them together, the new and the old picture. The, the, the 13 bits. That this picture you mean? Yeah. This picture 13. is the actual address. This is the actual address. You, I think you actually asked me. So I have to store the tag in the, in the cache? And the answer was yes. I don't have to store this or this. In other words, the, I'm gonna have an, a register and that register is gonna have the address field in it. You know, it's gonna be an address. That register is gonna be a 32-bit register and that register will have 32 bits of an address. And it'll say, please load the word at this address location. So I got that address. Now I'm gonna compare. I'm gonna say, take the first 30, you know, the first 15 bits or whatever they are, 16, 17 bits of the, of the address and compare it to these tags over here and see if it's there. But wait a second, don't compare it to every single one. Just compare it to the right one, which is the right one. The one that the set part of it tells me I should check, which is the modulo. In other words, the modulo tells me that it's all zeros. So I'm only gonna check, for example, if it's all zeros, I'm only gonna check this first row, this, that's, I'm just going to do that. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just going to check this row. What am I going to check in this row? The tag field. If the tag is the, if the first 17 bits match what the address that he wants me to give, that he asked for, it matches on this row, then I know that it's in memory. I've got it. Assuming that the valid bit is one. Then I just need to go over here into this huge block, which is of some size and find the particular byte I want. How will I know how far to go in this area? Well, look over here, the line offset. 
it's 100, it's, it's 128, it's five, oh yeah, how big is it? Um, two, four, eight, 16, 16, it's only 16. Uh, it's 16 uh, possibilities, and I'll check which numbers are here, and I'll go to that location over here. So this is what I'm storing, but there's an additional block over here with the register with the address that I'm looking for, and I'm comparing. I'm taking the set, I mean, there's maybe a picture like this. Here, here we go. I take the set field, and because the set field is nine, it tells me to go to this particular row, only that row, that's the modulo. And then, once I'm at that row, I'm gonna check the, what the tag is at that row. I'm gonna say, look at that tag, here's the tag that's been stored there. Is it equal to the tag in the address that he gave me? And I'm gonna do an equals operation. And if it is in fact equal, then I'm gonna put it to this and. And if this valid bit is actually one, Oh, then I'm in luck and I have a hit. Then I need to, if I have a hit, then I need to go to this particular location that the offset tells me to go to over here. So the only piece of information that I'm actually storing is the tag. The other piece of information are my guidebooks, are my guiding me where to go. I don't need to store the set. It's obvious that the set field of this row is whatever is, you know, is nine. That, that's the, you know, based on the modulo. That's the modulo. And the offset, I don't need to store. That's just telling me how far to go. In other words, once I have the block, once I know that the tags are equal, then I know that I've got the data and I'll just go and read it. Is that clear? Basically, this diagram explains it all. I wrote the tag in the cache is the same as the tag in the tag, in the tag, in the tag. The, the tag in the cache is the same as the tag in the address. That is, when we bring in a block from memory, we copy in the tag from its address. That's too many mistakes. Questions? No questions. It's all clear. Okay. Um, you present. Let's go on. So this diagram is very useful. Advantages, simple and cheap. Disadvantages, high miss rate, why? Because we, can, uh, we cannot choose which data to remove from the cache and which to keep. In other words, we can't have any algorithm for saying, let's keep the most useful data. We just have to, we simply use the modular function to decide, we may end up removing a block which is used highly frequently. Now this is true, but assuming we have a lot of blocks in cache, like from thousands of blocks, and assuming, and then since co programs run sequentially, I'm gonna want the first, I'm gonna want a set of blocks in a certain location, probably in memory, which means I'm not gonna have like this a, mo a modulo problem. What's a modulo problem? A modulo problem is that I need, like for example, before I need Dafka, you know, block 4, 8, 16, 32, you know, I need 4, 8, 16, 12, six, you know, four, sorry, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, I need all those ones. And lo and behold, I have to keep on taking, stretching out. That's very unlikely to happen because I'm gonna have lots of, I'm, gonna, I'm usually gonna have a situation where I have like some thousands of lines of cash, thousands of blocks. And, but more importantly, I'm gonna need block one, two, three, because I'm at that location in my code. And then I'm gonna need three, four, five. And then I'm gonna need six, seven, eight. And there's, I don't usually need, you know, skipping around huge amounts. So 
it's actually not such a big problem, but it is a problem. Meaning of the valid bit. So I explained that already. When, when, the, when the processor initially receives power, random data enters the cache. This is meaningless data. And so at startup, the processor must set the valid bits for all the blocks to zero. Because to say that whatever data is there is not what I mean. Once a block is read into the cache, that row's valid bit will be set to one. And it will always be one because I'll only remove it to put another person there, to put another block there. So once in the beginning, everything is zero. By the end, everything should be one. I mean, if it's a big program. That is, while I'm swapping something out and putting a new one in, it's going to be, I'm going to put it back to one. It'll be one the whole time. I mean, it won't be, I won't access it in the middle of the swap, but it'll be a one before it was valid data. And now it's still valid data. Which block should be removed from the cache when the requested block is not in cache? Since we use the modulo function, there is only one block that can be removed. So there's no real, there's no real difficulty in answering this question. We're just going to remove the block that is in that set. It is the cache block with the same set number, right? In other words, remember we said the set number determines that it's going to go Dafka to this row. So with the same set number, it's going to go exactly to that row. So any number that any number whose these bits are identical will go in the same place. This makes the choice simple to make, but often usually, but often usually not the ideal choice. Forgive my, trend, my, my writing here. Um, answer the fourth question regarding writing the data. When the processor writes to cache, will it also write to the main memory? Or will it only write to cache and update the main memory whenever the block is removed from cache? So we talked about this. And the answer is either method can be used. And this choice is independent of the answer of question three. In other words, the fact that we're using um, you know, the modulo function doesn't mean that we have to do right back or right through. Doesn't mean we have to, when we, when, when we do remove something from cache, it doesn't, it doesn't affect what behavior, how we, how we deal with that, how we deal with changes in the cache and how they should, how should they, remember the question is how do we deal with changes in the cache, how they should be reflected back to the main memory. So let's explain the two methods. And like I said, you can choose either method if you're doing the modulo system. So the one, I think we talked about this, the right through and the right back. Did we talk about this? Yeah, we mentioned it. We mentioned it. So I'll mention a little bit more detail. When the processor writes to cache, it simultaneously writes to main memory. That's the write through method. In other words, that's the idea. It simultaneously writes to both places. Note that only the single datum that was written to gets written to main memory. The processor will have to wait for the main memory to write which is slower than the cache write. So in other words, we're going to do two things simultaneously, but really we're not going to do them simultaneously. We're going to start them simultaneously, but they we're going to finish writing to cache a lot sooner than we finish writing to main memory because main memory is bigger and therefore slower. When a block is removed from cache, when we finally do decide to remove a block from the cache because we need to replace it, there's no need to write it back to main memory since all the changes have already been recorded. That's simple enough. Of course, we have this problem that we're slower. Every time we write, we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to wait. We're going to start a process, like I said, at the same time, but we're going to finish it. We have to wait for the slower one to finish. Write back, the, the other method. Only write to cache. Now, there's every time we have writes. By the way, we're always talking about writing because reading is, doesn't affect the cache. But we're, whenever we do these writes to the cache, we're just going to write to the cache. But when a block is removed from the cache because we have to, um, put a new block in there. If any data in that block was written to in the cache, then the whole block must be written back to main memory. In order to do this system, we have to add a dirty bit to the block, which we didn't have in this picture, but you can imagine just like it's a valid bit, there'd be one more line here with a dirty bit. One more thing, the memory, the cache will get slightly larger. Of course, that's so small that we don't really need to count it. But yes, we'll have to have another bit there. When the data is written to a block, when, any, when one piece of data is written to a block in cache, that block's dirty bit is going to be set to one. You know, and then it'll remain one until I finally do a write back. Um, right. It doesn't matter whether I wrote to the cache many times or only one time. 
Whenever blocking cash needs to be removed from the cash, if the dirty bit is one, that means it's dirty, then the DMA, which we talked about before, writes the block back to main memory, and it does it fast, does the DMA. Even for one day to write to cache, the whole block will have to be written. Because we're not gonna keep track, in order to do it any other way, we would have to know exactly which data was written to. And then we'd have to keep back a whole system, we'd have to have like a lot of data to keep track of which one was written to, and that's a waste of data. So we're just gonna keep one bit for each block, and that tells me whether the block is dirty or not. Write back has several advantages. Writing to the main memory is done by the DMA, which makes it fast when we do write back. When we write back that whole block, we're gonna use the DMA, it'll be fast. In write through, the processor writes to memory, which is slow. So we're gonna be using, even though less data is written in the write through, it could still take more time than the write back, which is using the DMA. Other advantages. Uh, the processor in the write back is available for other tasks while the write back is occurring. Right? If the DMA is busy copying back the block, then the processor is, is available for two other things. The DMA is off doing that task and we can continue running our program. In write through, when the data, I mean, we can't continue writing our program because we need to wait for it to finish writing before we can put in our data block that we want to use. So we actually can't write the, continue writing the program. But, the, but that's why I wrote, the, pre the processor is available for other tasks, whatever other, you know, there might be some other program as well. In write through, a good question. In write through, when the data is written, the processor is busy writing, right? Every time he's writing that single data, he's doing it, not the DMA. So he's busy. So write back does have the disadvantage that it needs to maintain a dirty bit. And we'll have to write back a lot of data, even when there is little that has changed. But these are of minimal hindrance. In other words, small disadvantages. Second case, data is not in cache. So in other words, the, um, the write back seems better than the write through? Yeah, I mean, as much as we generally don't like to give grades, but it seems like the write back is better. I mean, more interesting, like I say, is what are the advantages and disadvantages? At least that's what I'm used to. But we can actually say that probably the write back is better. Even though, even though in a certain sense, it's like counterintuitive. You might think, well, why am I busy wasting writing all that stuff? It ends up being better. Ah, so we all we talked about where the where the memory was in. We talked about writing or reading from memory, and you went and looked for it and you found it and you read it. What if it's not in memory and I want to write to it. I want to write to a certain block, not a certain block, a certain byte. I want to write to a certain byte and its block is not in memory. Now, what should I do? Well, what I've been saying all along is that I should load up the, by, the block into the cache, then write to the cache. And then if it's a write back method, I'll light up the dirty bit. And if it's not a write back method, if it's a write through, then I'll write to the cache and simultaneously write to the main memory. Now, if I mean, let's think about this. Maybe I'm just loading up a block and all I'm interested in doing is writing one piece of data. Look what a waste. I'm loading it into cache and then imagine I'm doing write through. I'm anyway gonna write to the main memory, but I'm also gonna write to the cache. And then a minute later, I'm gonna kick it out of cache because I need to put somebody else there. So there's another, so there's two possible ways of doing this. There's another way of doing it, which is, the, which is the no write allocate method. The processor just updates the main memory without touching the cache. In other words, you want to write, the data is not in the cache. I'm going to have to go to main memory anyway. So I may as well just write directly to main memory and be done with it. That's called the no write allocate. And I don't, that's under, that's when I want to DMA. write, I don't do an allocate. No, it should really be called. It should be called no allocate on write. That's really what I would call it. No allocation on write. When it's a write, when you want to do a data write and it's not there, don't allocate. Don't put it. In, allocate means don't put it in cache. 
Uh, Yitzi, you have a question? The right allocate means we make the appropriate space in the cache available for the block, and then we load the block from memory into cache, and then we write the data following either the right through or the right back method. That's what we've been explaining up till now. But you should know there's also something called the no right allocate. But the no yeah. right allocate, is that done using DMA? This is not going to use DMA. Because only, no, we're not going to use DMA because we're not going to write a whole block. We're just going to write one piece of data. The guy wants to do a, a store word. We want to store or a store byte, let's say, a store byte. He wants to store a particular byte. Are we going to load up that whole block into the cache and then store the byte and then copy it back into the data, into the memory? Well, no, the, the, the CPU can directly access the main memory. Let him go there, let him write, and be done with it. I don't need to use the cache in that case. Why, when, I, when would I use the cache? When I want to do, well, you say, what about read? Why should read be any different? Maybe I just want to read one byte, just read directly. Why bother loading it up? Well, then we'd never have the cache. <laughs> then we'd never have anything in the cache. Um, the, I think the assumption is that reading happens a lot more than writing. So on the reads, we'll load things up on the assumption that we'll probably read the next data and the next data and the next data. But on writes, we very rarely, you know, occasionally we write a lot, but usually we don't write a lot. So we won't allocate for the writes. Of course, if somehow we would have a magic uh, a crystal ball and, and know the, that we're going to need to write a lot of things in this particular block, then obviously it would make sense to put it in cash. But we don't have a way of knowing that ahead of time. So anyway, I, it seems to me that the right allocate system is, is in general a more logical system. But there is a no right allocate system. Uh, when we bring data from memory into the cache, we need to update the valid bit and the tag and the dirty bit if we are following the right path. Right, oh, that's obvious. Okay, example one. Um, well, let me just change that. I don't need to have this here. Okay. Given cache memory has the following characteristics, 32-bit main memory address, block size is also 32-bit. So the block size is 32-bit, which means it's how many bytes? I mean, sorry, it's 32 bytes. How many bits do we need to represent 32 bytes? Well, it means we have to represent up to 30, up to 16. Because it'll be 16 plus a eight plus et cetera. So one, two, four, Eight, 16, five bits. So our block size, if it's 32 bytes, it's obviously of size uh, five bits. In other words, the index, the field that we called the offset over here is gonna be five bits, just like this example, zero to five. That's the first thing we want to figure out. We always want to figure out the offset size. That tells us how big our bytes are. I mean, our bytes, how big our blocks are. Then we need to figure out our set field, how many we have. The size of the cache is 16 kilobytes, excluding the metadata. In other words, we're not counting, we're not thinking about the metadata, like the valid bit, the dirty bit, the tag, even the tag is metadata. You, know that you should be familiar with that term, metadata. Metadata is data which describes data. And that's what a valid bit is. It describes whether this data is valid. It describes whether this block is dirty, whether this data is dirty, and describes which data it is. That's the term, metadata, you'll see it in your programming life. That's, that's the term, it's an interesting term. It's metadata, it describes data. So the size of the cache is 16 kilobytes, which is two to the 14th bytes. Ah, so wait a second. So how big is the set? In other words, the total size of the cache is 16, is two to the 14th. The total size of the cache from here down to here is two to the 14th. Well, the two to the 14th means it's including all the different bytes inside of each row, adding them all up. This is byte zero, essentially, in the cache. And this is byte two to the 14th minus one. 
in the cache. Now, if each row is five bits long, then it stands to reason, well, I believe, you guys who are good at math will tell me, if it's five bits row, it seems to me that it should be eight bits for the uh, set field. Because eight and five is 13. And 13 is 14. No. Why didn't I say, why didn't I say nine bits for it? Can anyone tell me why? Why do I think it should be eight? In other words, this. How many bytes do I have? Two to the fourteenth, which means the last byte in digits is two to the thirteenth. Really, it's two to the, is is two to the thirteenth. Which bits are lit? Two to the thirteenth bit. Two to the twelfth bit. Each of those bits are lit. Means the last bit that's going to be lit to get to be two to the fourteenth minus one, in other words, is going to be two to the thirteenth bit. So really, I in order to indicate all of them, I have two to the thirteenth bit, and each row is taking already that's thirteen bits, and each row is five bits. So thirteen minus five is eight. So he says the question is find the size of the fields. I already found the offset. And I already found the set, which was I already did it all. I did it in my head. Let's see if you can do, let's see if I'm right. The offset is five bits because each block has 32 addressable pieces of data. So he said that, that's the five. The number of rows is 512 in direct map, right? In direct mapping, the number of rows in the cache equals the number of blocks in the cache. Why is it 512? How did he get to 512? Oh, he, he disagrees with me, he says nine. What? I mean, it's a little bit strange. The number of rows is 512. Ah, because, how do you get 512? Anybody? The number of rows in the cache equals the number of blocks in the cache, obviously. The number of rows is number, oh, here's gonna calculate. Number of rows equals the cache size divided by the number of data, there are the amount, the number of data in block, should be the amount of data in block. How, what's the amount of data in the block? Well, it's not two to the fifth. That's a mistake. Isn't that wrong? Anybody? Isn't the amount of data two to the sixth minus one? Or no, two to the sixth. I've got five bits. Hello, nobody's alive. All right, anyway, we gotta end now. We have a next class. Uh, uh, I'll stop, but I think there's a mistake here. You guys can look it over. Your homework is look it over and see who's right, me or him. Me or the slides. Uh,